So we are featuring um, work, uh, the latest research of, and, and work of various kinds by members of the Global Expert Network on Copyright User Rights, which is a global network of over 100 copyright academics from around the world that are interested in studying um, various aspects of limitations and exceptions and, and other aspects of user rights within copyright law that allow um, either compensated or uncompensated uh, uses as a matter of right uh, for various um, institutions, persons, etc. cetera. Um, the, the series is designed to highlight, especially policy relevant work of the network that's focusing on um, pressing debates of the, day, of the day. And today we're extending our series on technical issues being debated in the sweeping copyright reform in South Africa that's become very much a focus of, of copyright reform attention around the world. Um, next Friday, I want to mention um, on November 20th, we'll conclude this aspect of the series for the fall. We'll begin again next year um, with a lecture on what could happen if South Africa does not complete its amendments. So professors Christoph Geiger and Alan Rocha will discuss the action of courts in the EU and Brazil that have effectively opened restrictive copyright exceptions through fundamental rights analysis. So essentially holding that where copyright law is too restrictive, fundamental rights interpretation itself can be used to open closed lists of exceptions. So that'll focus back on the, on the limitations and exceptions and fair use parts of, of the South African bill generally, but that issue um, more generally. So today we're featuring the work of our close partner, uh, Martin Semflebin, a professor of information law uh, at the Faculty of Law at the University of Amsterdam. And he's taken over the directorship of the Institute on Information Law, EFIR, uh, which is a close partner of PIDGIP and a lot of the work that we do together, including um, a new project that we should be announcing soon. Um, he'll be sharing updates of his previous work on protecting creator remuneration through copyright uh, lessons from Germany and the Netherlands and um, as applied in this new context in South Africa. So this is an issue, artist remuneration, that's being actively debated in the South African copyright reform. Uh, the copyright bill was recently sent back to parliament in part over a concern that its requirement that authors and, and makers of, of musical works uh, receive fair royalties from creators, including in existing contracts. And the argument was that that, that application of the norm to existing um, uh, contracts was an arbitrary and retroactive application of the law. And I just wanna show you very briefly um, the key provision that's, that's at issue um, in South Africa, if I can find it on, okay, let's see here. Okay, and there it is. Okay, sorry for the technical glitch. So um, in the South African copyright, there's a series of related sections. It's uh, 6A, 7A, and 8A of the law, but they all have a, a similar uh, structure. And they provide up in uh, 6, 6A a right to a fair share of the royalty. And then down in the last section, 7A of, of each of these provisions say that that right applies to, oops, sorry, applies to an assignment that takes place before the commencement of the act. And that application that, that, that clarifies its application to existing contracts today that take place before the act has been challenged as being an arbitrary taking of the property of the people who signed that original contract. And I'll just point out the important provision, which is in 7AC, which makes clear that that application to previous contracts applies only to payments prospectively. So it doesn't require the payment for past acts. It, only, uh, it applies only to prospective uses of the same work. So for instance, if there was a, 
uh, past contract with um, a musical, uh, you know, a, a musical performer or a musical writer, and uh, they assigned their contract for a lump sum, you know, for a uh, for ten shillings in the case of Solomon Linda, right, um, the famous South African author of of The Lion Sleeps Tonight, uh, or Mabube as it was as it was called then. Uh, he was paid a lump sum of something like 10 or 50 shillings or something for all of his rights perpetually. And that music later made millions and millions of dollars, right? But so it wouldn't apply to repay for those lost profits. But the next use of that song, then it could be renegotiated and require a, a, a fair royalty prospectively. So that's how South African law um, operates or is proposed, this is in the copyright amendment bill, so this is not in effect yet, but that's the provision that was being objected to in part um, by the president's letter. So today, to give us um, some added context and analysis for how that purpose, the purpose of allowing to some degree the renegotiation of past or uh, you know, present or future unfair contracts could possibly proceed, we're gonna turn to um, Martin, who's done work around, um, his previous work was focused on Dutch and German examples that, exist, that existed already before the 2019 Digital Single Market Directive actually applied this EU-wide. And so he's updated some of that research for us and is, and is continuing to uh, update that research uh, looking at the South African example. So he will uh, explain his, some of that research to us first. And then as usual, I have a, a couple ringers lined up to ask the first couple questions, uh, including um, uh, a professor from South Africa in the EU. And then we'll open it up to wider questions and answers. If you would like to get into the queue to ask a question at any time, um, you may raise your little blue hand in the participants function in Zoom and that will put you in the queue and I'll turn to you after, uh, after our first questions take place. So, Martin, with that introduction, thank you um, for all your work on this topic and for your partnership with us more generally. And we're over to you in your hands. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for the, for the nice introduction and also for laying groundwork for the discussion. So I hope the screen share works well. You should now have the title sheet on your screens um, saying protecting creator remuneration through copyright. Um, I also uh, put quickly in the title um, South Africa Copyright Amendment Bill. As uh, Sean has just explained, this is kind of in the background, uh, the underlying general theme. But to be honest, um, and I would like to point that out before I even start, I'm not a specialist in South African law. so. Um, uh, whatever I say during the next 20, perhaps uh, 30 minutes is really based on my work on uh, Dutch, German, and now also EU-wide um, harmonization efforts in that area. And so it's intended to serve as a basis for further discussion uh, where, of course, the South African perspective can be um, very important and fruitful. So. Um, Germany and the Netherlands, I think um, it is fair to say, are countries that within um, the European context um, uh, are very much advanced in this area of uh, granting specific uh, contractual rights to authors, creators, performers, and so on in the copyright legislation itself in order to ensure that they have a stronger position with regard to exploitation negotiations and exploitation contracts, which they conclude. Uh, so the general idea underlying that legislation is the feeling that their bargaining power is not strong enough when you just rely on market forces. In both countries, we can make a distinction between two types of uh, fair remuneration rights. Um, one is a step to say there should be a fair remuneration right that operates from the very beginning of concluding a contract. So even before the exploitation has started, the author should already have a reassurance that he is entitled to a fair share of remuneration. So that is what I call fair remuneration ex ante. And then there's a second part, which is fair remuneration ex post. And this is the situation where you embark on an exploitation and you conclude a contract, 
And let's say there was no expectation whatsoever that the work would be particularly successful, but finally it turns out to be a huge success, a bestseller. And then as an author, you would have a right to revisit the question of renovation and say, well, listen, uh, when I now look at the whole success of this information product, I think I should receive a better share um, of um, the royalties accruing from this exploitation. So um, let's look at these two elements first, and then I broaden the discussion by also including the recent developments at EU level. Um, fair remuneration ex ante traditionally in the two countries um, have led to um, legislation aiming at more bargaining power. In Germany, this happened already in 2002 with a new provision in 32.1 of the German Copyright Act that grants a right to fair remuneration in the sense of a right to ask for a contract modification if the remuneration granted in a contract turns out to be insufficient. Of course, the problem then is what insufficient or unfair uh, remuneration standards, what that actually means. Um, the German legislation, uh, legislation tries to solve this problem by saying the starting point is the customary remuneration in the creative industry sector concerned. But the legislator also understood that in some sectors, the customary rules may be insufficient. So the legislator added the word honest. So in case there is a certain sector where you have, a, let's say, structural underpayment of creative uh, contributors and workers in the sector, then you should be able um, to challenge this and to change the customary remuneration standard by saying the whole practice in the sector is not honest. Um, so that's the German approach. The Dutch followed in 2015 uh, with a very similar provision, also granting a right to fair remuneration. And we have a more recent development, as I already indicated, the European Union in its most recent uh, piece of copyright legislation, uh, the Directive on Copyright in the Digital Single Market, also included new rules on copyright contract law and Article 18.1 of these new harmonized provisions also grants a right to appropriate and proportionate remuneration. So far, so good. Um, still, I would say um, it is fair to conclude that for the time being, these ex ante provisions are still yeah, a toothless tiger, I think it is fair to say. So there have been assessments of um, these uh, parts of the copyright legislation in Germany and also in the Netherlands. And um, there seems to be consensus that it doesn't change too much in practice. Well, why is that? Um, the problem is, of course, the burden of proof. Um, if you are a creator, an author, a performer, and you feel that the remuneration that you receive under the exploitation contract you have concluded, you feel that that remuneration um, is not in accordance with the standard, then you have a burden of proof because you bring the claim. Um, as the claimant, you have to provide evidence of the customary remuneration standard in the sector, which is already quite something. I mean, very often um, we have parts of creative work that depend on all kinds of impact factors, um, are perhaps dependent on individual circumstances. So to find really a customary remuneration rule for the sector can be quite a challenge. And then you have to give evidence of fair remuneration in comparable circumstances. So you have to say that the remuneration that you receive with regard to the specific work you have been asked to carry out is not according to the standard when you compare it with other contracts that have been concluded for comparable types of work. And then these other contracts may be unavailable, perhaps because there are clauses saying these contracts should be kept confidential and so on. So the burden of proof is quite an issue. Um, Dutch and German legislation uh, try to alleviate this problem by saying we establish an option um, 
for creating so-called common remuneration rules. What is this? Well, um, the CRRs, the common remuneration rules, um, are the result of negotiations between exploiters or associations of exploiters and a representative association of creators. So the idea of the legislator is, let's bring the parties to the table, let's bring a representative group of um, exploitation, ex exploitation companies in the creative sector to the table and a representative group of authors, creators, and let's have them decide on what they find is a fair remuneration rule, a fair standard for the sector. This is then legally presumed to be fair. So this directly serves an important benchmark function and should allow individual authors to give evidence of a deviation of this from this fair remuneration standard. The problem is, of course, again, I mean, um, nice try, you could say, um, but in the legislation, um, there is not much of an incentive for exploiters to enter into these common remuneration rule negotiations. Why should they? Why should they set a particular standard for the whole sector? And so um, there have been also controversies about the question whether this is not an invitation made by the legislator to form cartels and enter into cartel um, negotiations. Germany remained un unimpressed and says uh, these common remuneration rules um, coming out of negotiations between the parties can be directly enforced as a standard in the sector. The Netherlands are a bit more careful in the Netherlands, the parties of these negotiations um, can go to the Ministry of uh, Teaching, Culture and Science and ask the minister to formally declare these rules binding after the minister has heard an advisory body. Um, but this would only happen on joint request of the parties. So far, um, the European Union competition authorities remain silent on this point of cartel formation being encouraged by the legislator. Um, I think the new legislation that we have at EU level also shows that um, the European Union officials are not that much concerned about this point. Um, another development that we see in order to alleviate the problems in that area is quite a bit of court activism. Uh, in Germany, for instance, there is a series of um, decisions taken by the highest court in Germany, the Federal Court of Justice. Um, it started with common remuneration rules that had been established in, nego in negotiations between some publishing houses and writers of fiction books. So we had common remuneration rules for writers of fiction books. And then the court said in the first decision, we can apply these rules by analogy to translators of fiction books. And then in a further decision, the court even went a step further and said, we can apply a double analogy. So what we have said about translators of fiction books can also be adapted and be tailored to uh, finding common remuneration rules for translators of popular science books. Um, how do we look at this kind of court activism? Well, on the one hand, you can say this is a good thing because it broadens the beneficial effect of existing common remuneration rules. So in the German example, we only had these rules with regard to writers of fiction books and they have then been extended by the court to translators of fiction books and translators of popular science books. On the other hand, this kind of court activism, of course, uh, makes the threshold for entering into these negotiations for common remuneration rules extremely high. So the deterrent effect and also um, the dynamics in the sector are of course changing because whenever a new common remuneration rule is established then the rest of the sector will say, what have you done with the next court decision what you have agreed upon may be extended um, to other types of the sector and other remuneration questions in the sector. So in a nutshell, I would say these ex ante remuneration rules still remain um, 
rather unsuccessful in practice, even though there are certain steps taken by the legislators to make this system actually work. Um, from a practical perspective, um, we can be much more positive about fair remuneration rules ex post, the so-called bestseller clauses. So here is the German example, um, which requires a striking disproportionality between the honorarium paid and revenue accruing from sales of um, uh, the literary or artistic creation at issue. Um, this is already a departure from the former bestseller clause in Germany, which required a gross disproportionality. And we expect that the implementation of the latest EU legislation will lead to just disproportionality without these extra qualifications. Um, the debate in Germany is already quite vivid on the question how much of a deviation is necessary. 20% uh, below um, uh, what would have been fair considering the success of the work or 50% below this benchmark. Um, that's something uh, where the German courts have not found agreement yet. In the Netherlands, um, we have a very similar clause requiring severe disproportionality, but also this word severe um, is expected um, to be abandoned um, because of the implementation of EU legislation. The challenges with the bestseller clause traditionally are particular um, the question of how to pass on the responsibility in the distribution chain. Um, you have one contracting party, which can be a publishing house, um, which can be a music producer, film producer, and so on. But then your contracting party um, may uh, transfer copyrights uh, to other parties further down in the distribution chain, gives licenses, sub-licenses, sub-sub-licenses are, are, are quite common, in particular in the music business. And then the question is, of course, if, let's say, uh, the particular success of your work makes just one player in this distribution chain rich. How do you approach that player and make sure that even though it is not your direct contractual partner, uh, but a sub sub licensee, um, how to ensure that this player then pays uh, the fair remuneration ex post? Um, there's also a discussion about the impact on the cross financing of productions. That's an argument that you hear quite often from the industry, saying that um, they need these more or less surprising successes of works in order to compensate for the many, many other works which they produce and which do not have the expected success in the marketplace. So the industry argument is to say, if you take from us the specific uh, bonuses that we get from best-selling works, uh, then we don't have the financial resources for um, supporting and producing work that does not seem very profit promising. So we don't have the necessary risk capital any longer. So this has made these provisions controversial. Um, the impact in practice is that we see a shift from fixed uh, lump sum honoraria to um, revenue shares reflecting market success. Uh, quite clearly, when you give an author or performer a share of the royalties that accrue from the exploitation of the work, um, then you are in a safer position, you could say, uh, because the royalty share um, makes sure that the author automatically receives um, a share and gets a part of the huge success of the work. Um, the question uh, with, with uh, this development from a fixed lump sum honorarium to a royalty share regulation is, of course, how beneficial this is for individual authors and performers at the end of the day. Um, personally, I always thought that this would be very desirable, but I will show later in a second that there is also a bit discussion about this in the meantime. Um, before turning to these details, um, let me quickly say something about the developments at EU level. Um, so what I just explained is basically uh, the situation that has evolved in Germany and the Netherlands. And now at EU level, we have this new piece of legislation, um, the new directive on copyright in the digital single market, 
Um, new copyright legislation that is highly controversial in several respects, uh, for instance, with regard to filtering obligations of online content platforms, with regards to text and data mining provisions, um, with regards to a new neighboring rights uh, for press publishers and so on. Um, but there is one element of this new harmonization effort um, which I find very positive and uh, many commentators in the European Union find very positive and this is the introduction of harmonized EU-wide rules on copyright contract law. So uh, let me explain a bit what these harmonized rules are. Um, well, first of all, we get a generally recognized principle of appropriate and proportionate remuneration. Arguably, this is both ex ante and ex post in Article 18.1 of the DSM Directive. Member states shall ensure that where authors and performers license or transfer their exclusive rights for the exploitation of their works or other subject matter, they are entitled to receive appropriate and proportionate remuneration. Um, well, as in the Netherlands and in Germany, this is a very nice uh, statement. Um, when you look at the guidelines for national implementation, it already gets a bit more complicated because the legislation also points out that in implementing this, you have to balance this interest of authors against freedom of contract and you have to ensure a fair balance of rights and interests. Um, the legislation is quite interesting also from the perspective of assessment criteria. Recital 73 says that we have to look for um, finding this appropriate and proportionate remuneration level. We have to look at actual or potential economic value of the license or transferred rights. Then, of course, the contribution of the author or performer to the overall work. And then, of course, the sector specific parameters of market practices and the actual exploitation of the work. Um, and now I can revisit this question of um, honorarium or royalty based um, remuneration in the sense of a percentage, a share that you get of all uh, the remuneration accruing from the exploitation. Um, EU legislation says this is not the end of buyout contracts. A lump sum payment can also constitute proportionate remuneration, but it should not be the rule. So quite clearly, the EU legislator also says um, that a share of the royalties, a certain percentage, is an important component of arriving um, at a fair remuneration for the work of authors and performers. Um, I would like to contrast this with um, a bit of empirical work that has been done. Um, so you see here a study which our colleague uh, Martin Kretschmer um, with his team at Glasgow uh, University conducted, uh, conducted its uh, 2018 survey um, of earnings of writers in the UK. And what they found, interestingly, is um, a corrosion, you could say, of advance payments. So I have here um, um, one of the pages of this study where you see how these advance payments um, have been uh, reduced over time. When you look into the no category, um, then there was a no in 2006 in only 18% of the cases. In 2018, this is 31% of the cases. And uh, so the authors of this study say there's evidence of a significant decrease in the number of advances given to authors from the initial survey in 2006 to the most recent in 2018. The question then is um, whether the stronger focus on um, shares and royalty payments percentages is really something that is beneficial for authors in all cases. Um, in this uh, study, which I'm just showing here, uh, the argument is made that advance payments can also be very attractive because they reduce the risk also for the author or performer. Um, if you get an advance payment, you have money that 
is for sure, whereas a pure royalty is something that depends on the market success of your work. It seems to me that we have to find the right balance between advance payments and uh, royalty shares. And also, this is something that may differ from creative sector to creative sector. Um, so lots of further work and discussion is necessary in this area, I would say. Um, with regard to ex post remuneration, the new EU legislation um, has a specific further provision. Uh, which is a contract adjustment mechanism. And this is Article 20 of the DSM Directive, which says if there is no collective bargaining agreement providing for a mechanism comparable to the mechanism set forth in this article, then authors and performers or their representatives are entitled to claim additional appropriate and fair remuneration from the party with whom they entered into a contract for the exploitation of their rights, and now comes an important element, or from the successors in title of such parties. So this is understood to cover not only cases where the copyright is transferred, but also cases where the copyright is licensed or sub-licensed. So if we take um, um, the typical exploitation cascade in the audiovisual sector, then I understand this provision to mean uh, that you extend the bestseller claim to each and every player in the distribution chain. So you could bring such a bestseller claim also against Netflix, for instance. Um, so you don't have to focus only on the exploitation in movie theaters. It can also be a later um, party in the distribution chain, a successor in title. And then um, the requirement under EU law now is that the remuneration originally agreed turns out to be disproportionately low compared to all the subsequent relevant revenues derived from the exploitation of the works or performances. Um, as I said earlier, this EU provision is particularly interesting because it doesn't say um, severe disproportionality or gross disproportionality or some other modification. It only says disproportionately low. Um, there is a recital accompanying this, uh, which says the disproportionality should be clear, uh, but in the implementation proposals, this is not understood in the sense of the need to further qualify this disproportionality requirement. So this is why in Germany and the Netherlands, uh, the qualifications like severe disproportionality, cross disproportionality, striking disproportionality, this will go, I think, as a result of the implementation. Um, from an EU perspective, all revenues are um, relevant to the assessment, including merchandising revenues. So really the whole picture. Um, then, of course, the question is how much did the author performer contribute? If it's a work with multiple creative contributions like a film work, then you would have to look at the individual uh, merits of the contribution, the sector specific remuneration practices, and the existence of collective bargaining agreements. That's the exposed part. Um, there's another important element of this new uh, EU legislation. So bear with me for a couple of more minutes. Um, I know that in the online environment, it can be quite um, uh, can be quite challenging to listen to the same person for a longer period of time. So um, I assure you, it's just ten more minutes or so. Um, uh, but that's an interesting part, actually, the rights surrounding the fair share legislation. Um, the EU legislator has understood that in order to make this work, we need not only fair remuneration legislation, but we need a whole empowerment cascade. So the right to fair remuneration is only the starting point, but this right is relatively worthless if you don't have a right to information, if you don't know what the current exploitation activities and the current revenues are, and you cannot assess your position. And uh, you also need a non usus rights in the sense of um, getting your rights back 
if the exploiter is not active enough with regards to the exploitation efforts. So let's look um, at this empowerment cascade. Um, with regard to the right to information, we have a new transparency obligation. Article 19.1 says that at least once a year, taking into account the specificities of each sector, um, an author has to receive up-to-date, relevant and comprehensive information on the exploitation of their works and performances from the parties to whom they have licensed or transferred their rights and again, or their successors in title. So again, the EU legislator says this applies to the whole sector, not just the direct contractual partner of the author, but also um, further down the exploitation cascade. Um, this is extended to sub-licensees, um, either by contacting uh, your contractual counterpart or uh, contacting them directly. Um, but says the EU legislator, um, you can reduce this obligation to reasonable expectations. So of course, if let's say uh, you have a work um, that does not offer much revenues, um, then it would be disproportionate to have a very heavy um, transparency obligation. Uh, so if the value of the exploitation is only 100 euros, for instance, then it wouldn't make sense to introduce a transparency obligation, which internally in terms of administrative investment costs hundreds and hundreds of euros because then nobody would exploit these works any longer. And then um, we have again the collective bargaining rules, which may prevail when they meet um, the transparency standard. So that's the transparency obligation. Of course, um, with regard to confidentiality, um, there can be agreement to keep this information secret. But says EU legislation, authors and performers should always be able to use the shared information for the purpose of exercising their rights when they go to court and ask for more renovation in line with the new rules. Then we have the non-usus rights in 22 of the directive, which says that if you have granted your rights to an exploiter on an exclusive basis and there is a lack of exploitation, um, then you can get your rights back. Um, but of course, again, the specificities of the sector must be taken into account. Um, a plurality of authors may prevent the exercise of the right because the authors would have to agree on um, the return of the rights. And in any case, we have a grace period and a performance ultimatum. So you cannot simply use this right whenever you like. First, you have to give the exploiter the chance of uh, starting sufficient exploitation activity. So you can say, if you don't get active during the next half year, uh, then I will exercise this right. And only then you can make use of this new entitlement. Um, what we see at the national level experiences in Germany and the Netherlands with this type of right is of course that you get quite difficult discussions about how much potential a work actually has. Uh, the standard situation is of course that an author believes um, the work is very valuable and should have huge success. And the exploiter normally says, well, we have done whatever we could, but I can tell you your work is just not very much in demand in the market and we can't, can't change the market circumstances. So um, these cases can be quite difficult when they go to court. Um, which brings me to um, one of the final points. Um, there's one thing um, that has transpired very clearly, um, in particular in an evaluation that was done of uh, the Dutch legislation. Um, here is the link if you are interested. It is an evaluation report that has been drafted uh, at the, by the Institute for Information Law um, to analyze the results of uh, the Dutch copyright contract um, legislation. You find it on the EFA website. Uh, don't be afraid, um, uh, the report is in Dutch, but uh, there is an English summary and the summary is already um, uh, quite illustrative of the main findings. 
Um, and what you see quite clearly in this evaluation report is that there is blacklisting problem in these cases. Um, there is a high risk in um, the creative sectors concerned that an author who invokes these remuneration rights is seen as a very difficult person to work with, um, a troublemaker, and um, as in the creative sector, very often we speak about small, relatively small communities, um, the word can spread easily and then somebody might soon be blacklisted as um, a diva um, who better you avoid, uh, otherwise you get into trouble. Um, EU law tries to alleviate this problem a bit by saying that um, the author does not have to act in his own name from the very beginning. Representatives of authors and performers duly mandated in accordance with national law um, should be able to provide assistance um, and bring these claims. But of course, when you finally have to go to court, you have to um, stop the anon anonymity and to uh, really act in your own name. Um, but well, this seems to be at least a step in the right direction to um, alleviate this problem of blacklisting. Um, there's also at EU level an alternative dispute resolution procedure. Um, I must say experiences with this in the Netherlands are quite encouraging. So um, we have um, an individual body that is charged with um, these kind of dispute resolutions in the copyright area. And they have managed to issue one decision where uh, without too much factual basis, they seem to have found um, a way of uh, granting extra remuneration, an extra share of royalties, um, but basically um, based on um, considerations of fairness and reasonableness in the sector. Uh, so these uh, alternative dispute resolution uh, mechanisms are indeed important and it's a good sign that we now have this also as a harmonized rule at EU level. Um, the rights that I mentioned at EU level are partly um, inalienable. The transparency obligation, the bestseller clause and the alternative dispute resolution cannot be overridden by contract. Um, whether the rest is negotiable is something that we have to see in practice, whether the ex ante right is negotiable, for instance, or whether the non usus right is negotiable. EU legislation says um, in the implementation phase, um, national lawmakers can make this as an optional uh, provision depending on collective bargaining um, that then uh, replaces the non usus right. So we have to see. Um, which results we have in practice. Um, another big issue is, of course, uh, the circumvention of these provisions uh, through a different choice of law. In this respect, uh, Recital 81 says that there are all other elements relevant to the exploitation situation at the time of the choice of applicable law are located in one or more member states. So if the focus is on one or more member states, then these rules apply. Of course, um, it is a question of um, international private law to which extent uh, these rules in EU law uh, then also have the, um, the required effect in practice. But at least this is the attempt uh, taken at EU, EU level to avoid the circumvention uh, by just opting for another law. Um, I can say that in the Netherlands, uh, very much the same approach has been taken and it seems to work fairly well. At least um, when you bring claims in the Netherlands, it is difficult for exploiters um, to escape these claims by simply saying, uh, we have agreed to apply a different type of law to this exploitation situation. A final word, um, because it's my understanding that this is uh, particularly controversial in South Africa, um, the question of retroactive effect. Um, I must say, I would like myself more clarity in this respect um, in the new EU legislation. Um, it's not crystal clear. Um, Article 26.1 says that this new directive and its rules shall apply in respect of all works and other subject matter 
that are protected by national law in the field of copyright on or after 7 June 2021. That's the implementation deadline. So if you read this provision, we could understand it to apply directly to all the works that are still under copyright, which would mean they have a retroactive effect. But then um, the next paragraph says, um, this directive shall apply without prejudice to any acts concluded and rights acquired before 7 June 2021. And this has led in the discussion to exactly um, the dilemma which uh, Sean has already explained. So there are basically two approaches. One camp saying uh, contracts concluded after 7 June 2021 are the only contracts that are affected by this new legislation. So no impact on contracts concluded before the implementation deadline. This would mean um, we have to wait until these rules um, have relevance in practice because only new contracts concluded after 7 June 2021 would fall under these new rules. I think um, the alternative approach, namely um, the new rules are directly um, applicable to all acts of exploitation taking place after 7 June 2021 makes much more sense. So I understand this new legislation in the sense of saying all works that are under copyright um, are directly affected by this new legislation, but the new legislation only concerns acts of exploitation that happen after the implementation deadline. I find some support for this in a specific transitional provision, which is 27 of the DSM directive. Uh, with regard to the transparency obligation, the right to information, uh, the new legislation says agreements for the license or transfer of rights of authors and performers shall be subject to the transparency obligation set out in Article 19 as from 7 June 2022. So this is an extra privilege, a grace period for implementing this transparency obligation, so one year grace period. But at the same time, this provision says quite clearly that existing exploitation situations directly fall under the new legislation. So I see this provision as confirming that it is the intention of the EU legislation to cover all existing works and contracts that currently exist and cover all the exploitation activities that take place after the implementation deadline. So, um, well, I think that's about it, what I wanted to say um, about these uh, standards and new rules in the European Union. For further reading, I recommend um, a comment which we have made at EU level um, as a European Copyright Society. So, so that's a group of um, scholars um, in copyright law um, that issue opinions and share information on these new rules. When you look at the comment on the implementation of articles 18 to 22, you find lots of further useful information on these new provisions. That's it. Thank you so much. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Martin. There we go, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, here's the applause. We can applause virtually, etc. But uh, thank you for that that very very in depth you know review of all the different rules. I have to say I'm jotting down various notes on the complexities that I've noted. Uh, you know issues like choice of law is very interesting to think about um, in this huge multinational environment. But let me um, so as I as I mentioned, we have a, a couple. Commentators lined up. So, uh, Malbec, Professor Malabe Kane Ferreri from uh, University of Westerstrasse and Christoph Geiger uh, from Strasbourg has has uh, have agreed to give a couple of first comments. Um, I'm sorry we we lost John Simpson. He he said he had a, a meeting to go with, but he's he's been working in this space for a long time, and I, I invited him to to please do use the chat. So I think I think you'll find some interesting comments. Um, from him in the, in the chat function. But Mala Bakang, over to you, please. Yeah. Um, thanks, Sean, and thanks, Martin. Your presentation, quite captivating. 
So um, I've noted a couple of useful uh, provisions from the EU and compared to what we have uh, in the South African Copyright Bill. So as you know, our bill was uh, returned by the president to parliament because of uh, the deficiencies, some of which John has already attributed to. So uh, first of all, uh, when we talk of the right to remuneration, you know, in the EU, it's quite clear uh, what uh, the right to remuneration entails. Uh, you know, the fair and equitable remuneration, uh, the standard of which is embodied in um, appropriate and uh, proportionate remuneration. So in the South African uh, bill, there was no standard for uh, remuneration. So uh, that was problematic because already the authors are already, uh, you know, at the end of it all. So if the standard was not included, uh, the bill was not really useful. But I understand now that uh, uh, we, we are likely to incorporate um, the, the EU standard, we shall see, because right now the bill is back in parliament and obviously there is work being done uh, to it. But what was also disturbing in our current bill is that in the EU, there is still an option for a lump sum, even though it is only left for those uh, uh, limited circumstances. But in the South African case, the lump sum or the buyout was, was completely removed. And so the authors were only, um, uh, they could only get royalties. Now the challenge with South Africa is that uh, the authors are typically regarded as freelancers. Uh, and as a freelancer, you do not have access to the finance packages from the bank. So assuming you want to buy a house, that is problematic. We have to buy it cash. And this is why the cash lump sum well, you know, be, remains um, attractive to our authors here because they actually do not have uh, access to finance uh, given the status that uh, is attributed to them. So it might be that in future, uh, we will kind of uh, rethink this and still incorporate the lump sum. You know, some of uh, the traps that I have seen already uh, are such that the lump sum I mean, there would be an element of a lump sum plus royalties. So when I saw that, however, I thought that I think it is likely to divide the industry, which is already divided, because if we have to, um, uh, if uh, the owners have to pay lump sum plus royalties, I think that's going to be exorbitant on the part of, of course, it will be beneficial to the authors, but the owners are definitely not going to like it. It's either you get the lump sum or the royalties, but the combination of both, I think it's, it will be a deterrent. But nonetheless, we will see how uh, it, it pans out. And uh, again, by taking out the option of a, a lump sum payout, Basically, that takes away the freedom to contract available to both parties. Because if, if you are an author and you desperately want a lump sum, given the situation I have already narrated in South Africa, that as an author, you can't have access to, uh, to, you know, to get a mortgage from the bank, to get vehicle finance, unless you pay cash. And even if the bank eventually agrees to give you a mortgage or finance your vehicle, the conditions are usually terrible. Uh, you know, the interest rates would usually be high and we have to pay upfront some deposit, which a lot of times our artists don't have. We have seen right now during COVID, a lot of them were receiving food parcels. So it's, it's very important that uh, the lump sum remains an option. It, it, well, it should be regulated, uh, as is the case with the, that it is only available in limited uh, circumstances, because we do not want the authors to, you know, not to receive royalties, because we know that uh, 
the royalties are the way to go. Okay. Um, what I have also picked up from our bill is that the fair and equitable uh, standard in the bill, the current bill, was only applicable to the sound recordings, but the rest of the works, uh, they didn't have the standard at all. But also what worried me with uh, the standard of remuneration with the sound recordings is that it enshrines as two standards. One, you get on one hand, you get um, uh, a standard which requires the parties to share equally, right? On the other hand, you get a standard which talks to fair and equitable remuneration. So I think that is going to be, to be problematic because one clause entails two standards of remuneration, which I do not think that uh, the writers of this bill or the drafters of the bill intended it to be that confusing anywhere. That is an aside, but because what we are focusing on right now is the remuneration, not necessarily the problems with the wording of the bill, but I just wanted to flag that out. And what I have also, we have learned from uh, Martin's presentation that in the EU, um, the right to equitable remuneration is underpinned by the transparency in which the works are, trans are ex exploited. So in the EU, the authors and performers would be entitled to receive at least once a year an up-to-date, relevant, comprehensive information on the exploitation of their works and performances from the parties to whom they, they have licensed or transferred their rights or their successors in title, blah, blah, blah. Martin has talked about this in detail. So in the South African bill, we do not have the equivalent of Article 19 of the EU Copyright Directive. And this will defeat the whole purpose of the right to fair remuneration because you cannot claim fair remuneration when you are not aware of how your work is being exploited out there. So I think it's going to be important for us, uh, South Africa, to include the transparency clause. So the only clause that comes closer to the transparency is in relation to the regulation of uh, the collecting uh, uh, societies. But because the collecting societies are required to, you know, to make information available to the authors and so on. So we, we, we you know, you know, when when um, we may push those provisions to cater for the transparency deficiency clause, but I think we still need to have a standalone transparency clause, as it's the case with the EU. And in any event, where a person has licensed a work not through the collecting society, it follows that there won't be, you know, those provisions that apply to the collecting societies will not be available to a person who decided to license individually. And in the EU, as Martin has indicated, they have a right to renegotiate contracts uh, after concluding. If they realize that um, you know, the remuneration is not fair after they have concluded. In the South African case, we do not have uh, that provision. The only closest provision that we have is the one that is being objected to, which is uh, the retrospective effect of uh, the act. But you know, it doesn't really speak to the contract itself. It simply says that the act will have, or the bill will have a retrospective effect. And which means uh, that the contracts that were concluded before, I mean, the authors have to, going forward, the authors have to receive the fair and um, equitable remuneration. But as I have said, it does not really speak to the renegotiation of contracts, which I think is uh, it, it's a huge um, uh, oversight on our part as South Africa. Because initially, when authors sign contracts, they do not really foresee the consequences of their actions. And sometimes they have to go back. I understand that uh, in our case, the contracts are going to be standardized. There are certain clauses which every contract will, will entail, such as the rights and obligations of um, the parties, especially the, the authors, as well as uh, the rate of remuneration, 
and to the time intervals within which the remuneration will be paid. But you know, overall, when we talk about the royalty, there is that percentage, which I think uh, there has to be a scope for the parties to renegotiate at the later stage uh, ex, ex post. And in South Africa, what used to happen is that uh, the authors used to sign off their lives. But now the assignment is basically limited to a period of uh, the 25 years. I think it's commendable. And I just want to sum up and speak to the revision rights that we, uh, we have now incorporated in our bill. I, I had a look at um, the copyright directive. And what I have picked up from it is that where the, the person who commissioned the work is not exploiting the work, the author can basically get that work and license it to someone else. In the South African case, it seems to me that the wording of um, the clause relating to the reversion rights is only limited to, uh, you know, the license is only limited to the author uh, himself. It reads as follows. The person, um, if the person who commissioned that work does not use it for the purpose for which it was commissioned, the author can get an order licensing him to use the work for such purpose subject to the fee payable to the person who commissioned the work. So basically, it seems to me that only the author can um, use this work uh, you know, uh, as a result of the reversion. But in the EU, it can be the author using the work, or the author can license it to the third, the third party, if I understood it correctly. And lastly, in the South African case, I think the fair remuneration is premised on the regulation of collecting societies. Uh, this was a setback in South Africa. Our collecting societies were not regulated. They were not answerable to the members. But um, in the bill now, the collecting societies are regulated. And I think that um, the authors will receive fair and equitable remuneration if at the end of it all, we are able to incorporate the lessons uh, from the EU, such as uh, what it entails. I mean, such as the fair and equitable remuneration, which, as uh, which as Martin has uh, indicated, includes the. I mean, is based on the standard uh, entails appropriate. Um, so I think generally the bill will ensure that the authors get fair remuneration. But of course, there are those things that we still have to work on. Um, I think that's the end from my end. And I'll be happy to hear from um, other people uh, in relation to our bill and see how we can um, improve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Malawi Kang. That was, that was great. And, and just, I think really in, in some ways, Martin shows the influence of, of some of your work, you know, which we've shared a couple of different ways, but you know, on some of the thinking uh, uh, of the people thinking about South Africa. <laughs> um, Christoph, let me, let me invite you to come next and then we'll open for a more general discussion, but I see you've joined us. Yeah, Christoph, you're most welcome. Hi everyone. Hi, Martin. Uh, thank you very much for this for this great great uh, overview of uh, copyright contract law. Um, actually, I would like to give a more few more general comment and have your opinion on on one 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 issue. More general comment is maybe, um, and this might be interesting also in the South African um, discussion is. Actually, if there is anything which is important uh, at the very core of, of, of copyright law is the remuneration of creators, right? So this is at the core, but it's also at the core of many uh, provisions um, of um, uh, international human rights. So I'm very skeptical about the equation of IP as a human right, but if there is one aspect that we probably is the less controversial when you look at Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights is that creators uh, are protected in their remuneration aspect. 
So this is really something which is, I think, almost astonishing that we talk about this uh, and that we have to, to realize that only you has just implemented some rules to secure remunerations because it's actually the only justification or one of the main justification from a human rights perspective uh, for, for, uh, for the copyright system. So uh, this, I think, because in, in South Africa, constitution matters and constitutional right matters. I think this is an aspect that we should uh, always emphasize. And also in the, in the sense that, for example, uh, uh, remuneration of creators also secure their freedom of expression. So when the US constitution says copyright is the engine of free expression, well, if you have as an author some money to be able to create, you have some financial autonomy and you don't depend on states, you don't depend on patrons, you don't depend on, on sponsors, and you can be basically free to say whatever you want. So this I think is very important when we uh, underline it. It's not only uh, protected because uh, of some, uh, you know, uh, protective uh, measures, but also from freedom of expression and for diversity of, of opinions in a society. However, there's one point I would like to have your opinion, Martin, on this. Um, I have some doubts and, and I think I actually know what you will reply to this, but I have actually some doubts that uh, copyright contract law is basically the solution or at least the only tool uh, that we should have when it comes to remunerating creators. Because actually, I mean, you've said it, it's a toothless tiger, only mainly a few maybe, um, uh, very famous authors have the money to litigate, wants to do the effort. Uh, also, most of them, they don't know what they're signing and they don't want to do all this work. And, and at some point, maybe they get a lawyer when, they, when they're very famous, but most of the, the uh, authors, they hate this. They hate uh, uh, legal uh, provisions, they hate uh, lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. So here's my proposal. I mean, we have, in the EU, uh, some interesting uh, alternative to remunerate creators uh, via statutory remuneration rights. So um, these remuneration rights are often, and I think you've uh, advocated this also in your writings, sometimes more financially interesting for authors than uh, basically uh, their exclusive rights. They are unwaverable and you can basically also make sure that a substantial portion of the remuneration is attributed by uh, uh, law or by uh, 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 other means to the creator. So here, what I would say is if South Africa is, is thinking about finding ways to remunerate, remunerate creators, uh, do not copy necessarily what we have in the EU uh, in uh, only at least in, in uh, copyright contract law, but look also in our well-functioning redistribution system when it comes to uh, remuneration rights out of maybe exceptions, imitation, private copy is a good uh, example, but also other, other ways to remunerate creators, which are actually non-intrusive because non-exclusive. It's what uh, it's sometimes presented as a permitted but paid uh, solution. So um, this was my brief comment and my question to you, uh, Martin. Thank you very much again for this great presentation. Fantastic. So thank you, thank you both. And we're now open in general discussion. If anybody else has another comment, we can take it now, or we can allow Martin to respond to a couple of the questions raised. Let's see. I have Alan, one quick yeah. question. Uh -huh. Yes, hello, good morning. Hello, everyone. Uh, or actually, good lunch for you guys. Uh, I have another question, Martin. Um, I think I asked you this before, but I will repeat in a different way, because I believe I, I asked wrongly the last time. Is there any other mechanism, like contractual mechanism, that's outside the copyright law but we think the civil, you know, the civil law in general, like the law of contracts in general, which uh, would either, either get the author some leverage 
in uh, rediscussing or reassessing the contractual conditions for the fact that they are the weaker party or because they are unknowledgeable about the content of the contract uh, themselves and in of other circumstances like that. Because in civil law in general, there are like usually some remedies in contractual law to sort of uh, balance a little bit the, the parties when they are very unbalanced between themselves. Like we can see that in consumer law and other laws as well. So I wonder if authors could tap into any of those in the EU. Thank you. So sh should I perhaps say a couple of words in reaction to the comments? Otherwise I forget what I wanted yeah, to no, say. No, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, I think it's your turn now. And anyone <laughs> okay, else so, can so get in line by raising your hand in the uh, portal. Well, first of all, uh, Malaba Kang, thank, thank you so much for, for um, uh, your comments and also the information with regard to the specific situation in South Africa. I fully agree that an, an important lesson uh, to learn is, of course, that um, we, as, as lawyers, um, we must not think that we know better than the authors themselves what they are wishing for. So in this in this whole debate, I think there is there is quite a risk of just assuming that let's say uh, a royalty percentage is always better than a lump sum honorarium um, or some other general uh, presumptions. Um, I, I think it is very dangerous to make those. Um, but I also think that um, it's, it's not only black and white. So it's not just um, honorarium fixed and then uh, royalty percentage and, and you have to choose between those two. Um, we had a couple of court decisions where the courts actually navigated between those two quite successfully by saying, depending on the advance payment or lump sum honorarium that you have received, uh, the royalty share may be less so uh, by saying, if you have already received a honorarium of, I don't know, 20,000 euros, then you are no longer entitled to a royalty share of 12%. It will only be 7% or something like this. So um, this, this doesn't make um, uh, the, the determination of the right amount of remuneration easier, uh, but it is possible uh, to find tailor-made solutions between those two poles. Um, Turning to uh, Christophe's comments, um, I mean, I, I fully agree with the first point you made. As I see it, um, um, this discussion we are now having is really a very crucial one. Um, to me, it is a question of um, uh, life and death, basically. So if, if we don't manage to get this right, uh, then there is no good reason for justifying copyright protection altogether. So as I see it, the whole social legitimacy of uh, this field of law really depends on um, uh, ensuring that the money really ends up to a sufficient extent in the pockets of the individual creators and not just at industry level. Um, I also agree with you, as you know, um, uh, that uh, from my perspective, uh, general statutory remuneration rights, um, in particular in combination with uh, user rights, are a very good solution. I've proposed this myself with regard to user-generated content, for instance. I think that the whole debate that we currently have about filtering mechanisms and so on could have been avoided by just saying we don't filter at all Instead, um, uh, we introduce a broad exemption of user-generated content and make this a paid uh, user right um, with collecting societies, um, repartitioning the money among authors and creative industries and so on. So I'm, I'm fully with you. Um, uh, but as we also know, um, uh, not everybody is of the same opinion. Uh, in particular, industry representatives tend uh, to disagree. Um, I can say that uh, the creative community in the Netherlands has pleaded heavily for more of the statutory uh, remuneration rights, um, quite close to um, the proposals that you have made in, in, in several um, articles already. So um, um, there is clear indication in the Netherlands that they would prefer statutory remuneration rights rather than the traditional um, um, right to prohibit. So the really the exclusivity approach that we traditionally have. So yeah, 
Um, but still, with regard to the traditional uh, right to prohibit, um, this remuneration discussion is, of course, a relevant one. Uh, which brings me to uh, Alain's point, um, uh, which is also a very important one. I, I had this discussion several times already with, uh, let's say, the general uh, private law specialists um, um, that just have difficulty understanding why we need these special rules in corporate law at all. Like, can't the general uh, private law provisions that you have um, uh, do the job? Um, and the answer is, um, to some extent, they can. Uh, but with regard to the bestseller clause, um, I can give you one example of um, a problem that we encountered not only in Germany, but also in the Netherlands. In um, uh, the Netherlands and in Germany, the general private law provisions would require that the disproportionality was not foreseeable. So you would have to bring it under the clause for saying it was not foreseeable to the parties that this would happen. And so uh, there is a right to uh, kind of reconfigure uh, the contract. And this was uh, really a stumbling block in most of those cases because um, the judges said, well, if you, if you produce a work, it is generally known that some of these works can become bestsellers. So why didn't you include a provision on, the, on that if this was your concern? So um, I agree with you that the job could be done by private law provisions, um, but they haven't worked that well, at least in a European context in the past. And then we also see that if we rely on standard private law provisions, um, there's often there is not much room for change because a judge, if changing such a general provision of private law with regard to a specific copyright scenario, also fears that it could have repercussions in totally different unrelated fields of private law impact on, I don't know, insolvency cases, uh, what, what, what have you. Um, and so it is much more difficult to change these general private law rules than having an individual set in copyright law that you can um, adapt to the individual concerns and, and power relationships uh, in the market. Which brings me finally, I will stop in a second, Sean, um, back to uh, Maleba Keng's comments. At the end of the day, of course, um, we try to regulate something that very much depends on the market and the market power. If we hear that the starting point for this legislation is that we think the bargaining power of individual authors is too small, then this is the direct result of, let's say, um, too many people uh, willing to invest their time and effort in creative work because it is such wonderful work. So there is just when you look at supply demand, there is too much supply and too little demand. Um, so it's a bias market. And this market reality is something that is quite difficult to change, whatever legislation you have. Super great, thanks. So I have uh, two two more in line, uh, Mike Carroll and then Peter Yazi, and then I think we'll give you another shot, Martin, and then maybe we'll close our formal program and then we usually turn off the cameras and have a little cocktail party with no cocktail or no party. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and hi everyone, um, hi Martin. Uh, thanks so much for this presentation. I, I actually wanna, your last comment is very helpful because it's a, I'm wondering if we can uh, talk a little about these changes in terms of IP theory, and then I am interested in one the implementation of one in particular. But to your point that you know there seems to be a real tension that the, the the ease with which the European Union law le legislator is willing to override contractual freedom is always of interest on this side of the Atlantic, where we have this very strong ideology of freedom of contract. But you know, within the, theory, the basic theory of IP, the idea is that, that you create the exclusive rights in order to create a marketplace, in order for the marketplace to distribute the rewards according to demand. Um, and yet what you see with these provisions is then a, a kind of uh, democratic socialist response to the market saying, well, you know, the marketplace is not distributing the rewards sufficiently. And so the, the state needs to come in and uh, intervene in the market. And, and I guess I'd be interested a little in the political economy behind how these provisions made it into the DSM. Like who's, why, why weren't the large corporate buyers of copyrights 
I mean, they clearly have the political power to have stopped this. So, uh, you know, is do they feel like this is toothless and therefore it's politically it was it was a, a give they were willing to do? Or um, and then the one thing that even if they even if we don't see a lot of money flowing through this system, and I'd be curious to know if anyone could quantify the sort of annual, you know, uh, wealth transfer that this system produces. But the information transfer strikes me as something very interesting. This, this requirement to report to the author even after they've transferred the rights, you know, that this is a, it's, it's another one of these author rights conceptions that you still get to sort of track your child if we treat the work as a child and know how the child is doing in the world. That's quite fascinating. Um, and, and, and I suspect, I, that has independent value, I think, to creators and, and would be something that, you know, I think even within the open licensing world, we know that uh, creators would love to know how their work is being used and, and they do care about it. It's independent of their economic interest. And I, I'd just be curious to know how that, do you think that's really going to work though? Or is each and every musician on a musical uh, on a sound recording going to get a report about how often that the song they played bass on has has appeared across all the different music systems so they're kind of a compound question but uh take take what you want from them peter why don't why don't you go next and then we'll give martin a last chance to sum up. oh sorry peter you're on a So first, thanks, thanks to Martin for an extremely rich and provocative paper and to the commenters who, who added a great deal as well. Lots to think about. And I want to make one observation and then ask two, well, maybe one is slightly larger questions of Martin and, and who, whoever else, perhaps Christoph, might have a, a view about them. The, the observation is a historical one, and it is that uh, there has been in my 55 years of practice in the field of copyright law, only one historical moment at which there was a, a, a meaningful legal check on the economic power of let us say publishers, perhaps distributors is a better generic word, vis-a-vis -vis the weaker, structurally weaker author sector. And it was, it was not by no means perfect. And, and uh, it might've been, it might've been improved on. And instead it was effectively done away with in 1990, but it was the notion of a, a, a copyright renewal, which by operation of law affected a significant reversion of rights to the recipient of the renewal. It's complicated, the details, some of you know, some of you know, don't want to know. But the, the structure was that we had two separate terms of copyright, an initial term and a renewal term. And when a copyright claimant asserted their right to the renewal claim, they, at least under a pretty wide range of circumstances, got back rights that had been conveyed to others by a, a, a well, got back rights that they had conveyed to others during the initial term. Um, and that worked, it was crude, it didn't always work. Sometimes it worked too well, um, in the sense that it entirely flipped the negotiating posture between, between creator or creator's descendants and publisher, but it worked. It was, and I think that in the mix, as we talk about elaborate and somewhat effortful structures for accomplishing this, we shouldn't forget about the crude instrument of reversion as a way of doing rough justice between these two unequal sectors. And 
I, 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 I want to just leave that on the on the table. It's the as, as I say, in 55 years or so of doing it, it's the only mechanism I've ever seen that was actually effective. Now, the two questions are are, are these. One, Martin, fascinated me. Your your the notion that in the in the reversion schemes you described the duty to renegotiate or to pay additional royalties would follow title and that title in turn could be defined in terms of of licensing contracts and that that doesn't ring true under under US law where we are we're very sort of grudging about the question of who has title to a copyright. And so I'm interested in the notion that Netflix, for example, would be would be a title holder with respect to something it was distributing and therefore would have a primary as distinct from a kind of secondary obligation. And I'd love to hear more about that. The other question I wanted to ask goes back to South Africa. And it, you know, you you said, Martin, that as far as you could tell, although there was some technical ground for dispute about the question of retroactive application of these provisions to to correct licensing disparities, there was no serious dispute or room for serious dispute about the notion that future revenues with regard to previous deals were covered. Well, that's of course exactly what the big constitutional argument in South Africa is about. And I'm curious whether in your understanding there would be any sort of constitutional or fundamental rights issue in Europe around or arising from such an interpretation? End of questions. Martin, yeah. it's, it's over to you. And Christoph, you were name checked, so you have a right to reply as well, if you prefer. And then after that, we'll uh, end the formal session and turn off the camera. And everybody's welcome to hang out a little bit if they're, if they're free. So over to you, Martin. How much time do I have? Two more hours or something? Yeah, you have a couple <laughs> hours. Well, this is this is very rich. Um, so I, I try to be brief. Um, Michael, you, you asked about the um, environment that made this legislation possible. There's one simple answer to it. Uh, Brexit helped a lot uh, because uh, traditionally um, the UK um, with, well, understandably, understandably uh, the, the same uh, common law tradition and grammar as the US um, uh, insisted on freedom of contract and basically blocked quite successfully all these attempts. Um, with the UK leaving the European Union, there was a window of opportunity um, for um, introducing these rules. Um, so that's a practical uh, explanation. In terms of industry resistance, I think it's fair to say that, first of all, um, uh, the continental European legislators were quite determined to do this because Germany is, of course, a strong force and they had it already in the legislation and could say, our creative industry has survived this. And the creative industries also look at it a bit as cosmetics, I must say. Uh, because as the assessment um, efforts so far have shown, um, there is not much practical impact that we could point to. So when I hear a question like how much money has really been redistributed uh, successfully on that basis, it, the impact is not that much visible. So I think this explains why there was momentum for this. Um, of course, there is a huge battle about the transparency rule. Um, and there is basically a ping pong with the industry saying, um, we have to take very seriously the clause um, that um, disproportionate burdens must be avoided. And they say, well, um, in terms of administrative efforts, this is just excessive and we simply cannot do this for each and every little author. Um, that's something for the courts to um, 
uh, to, to find out. And I would not be surprised if this is one of the first issues that will be at the table after the implementation. So how successful these new transparency rules really are um, is a question. Um, from my own experience, uh, every time I receive a royalty statement from a publisher, I'm wondering um, if, if I can trust any of the numbers indicated they, there, because often they, they don't even say how many books they have sold or in which markets and at which price and so on. So, well, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you, if you see at least a bit of um, more transparency there. Um, and then, yeah, Peter, I mean, as always, um, these are the big questions, of course. I mean, from the very beginning, I think there has been this figurehead problem in copyright law that everybody points to the individual author to get protection. And then afterwards, the money is just uh, channeled to the industry. Um, um, I think this is just a new attempt to solve this. Um, the reversion of rights is a very good mechanism, I agree. Um, but I can also say there seem to be limits to this um, in... Um, uh, Dutch law, there was an earlier proposal to have a reversion of rights as a standard measure every five years. So you would get short intervals of the rights going back to the author every five years. And the authors were attacking this very strongly because they said, if we only can give an exploitation horizon for five years, then we only get paid for five years and we carry the risk of the work not being of any interest after those five years. So instead of getting, getting a payment for the whole exploitation or amortization horizon of 20 or 25 years in the sector, they feared that the redu reduction to a five year interval would do more harm than good. So in that case, I think what uh, Malaba Keng just said about South Africa, I think a 25 year term um, would make sense from these experiences in Europe because uh, you give uh, the full exploitation horizon uh, to um, uh, exploiters of the works. And then um, Peter, with regard to the retroactive effect solution, um, I don't see a constitutional challenge being bought so quickly on this um, uh, because we, um, um, as, as we see it in, um, in, in the European Union, property, including intellectual property, is something um, that is shaped by legislation constantly. So there can be new situations coming up. Um, which require the legislator to reconfigure the property position to some extent. So as long as it is not um, uh, really diminishing your property to almost zero, um, there will not be a claim that is successful so fast. But I also look forward to listening to Christoph, who might have more to say about this. Um, uh, but there are cases in Germany where in the arena of property as a fundamental right, uh, the court said very clearly, well, there is always a bit of change of circumstances. Uh, the road uh, suddenly goes in a different direction. You have less business and your your shop has uh, less value. Um, that's that's inherent in, in the general risks of life and business making. So I don't see a constitutional challenge being uh, successful um, very easily. But I stand to be corrected by Christoph, who might have more insights uh, than I have. That's what I wanted to say. Christoph, if you like, you have a right of reply. Okay, well, um, well I mean, uh, Martin has, has, has replied very, very well to uh, Peter's concern. I would just like to um, add maybe one element to, to, to Michael. Uh, who actually uh, rightly asked how these kind of provisions ended up in the in the directive at, at the end? Uh, it needs to be um, uh, underlined the draft proposal. Initially, they were not such uh, provision, so they came during the parliamentary discussion. So it was not some sort of a priority uh, for the legislator for sure. And it seems that it was like a little bit to to. Uh, make the the the, the um, everyone to to swallow the, this pill of uh, of 
intermediary liability and platform regulation that was uh, kind of going on in, in uh, one of the main controversial Article 17. Um, and it seems really that uh, all major industry was so focused on that article that they really thought, well, this is P that we're not going to really uh, fight for, for this. And if it gives a little bit of the legitimacy to this whole entire process, which were at some point really endangered of collapsing entirely, uh, well, it's a, it's a sort of a little gift we can give uh, uh, to, to, to creators and it makes us look uh, much nicer at the end. So uh, it is a little bit like this, that, that this happened. Unfortunately, it was not like one of the main proposal that um, the EU suddenly wants to do something for creators. And, but the, the result is pretty, pretty uh, interesting. I mean, uh, Martin has pre presented all these provisions. I mean, is, is more than more um, most of the European countries have in their national law. So it's um, really kind of, of, of a progress. Let me um, now conclude us and offer my final thanks. But so Martin, thank you so much for, you know, your additional research on this. Uh, when we called upon you to look at this issue in, in more depth and, and you really did and, and thank you for that. And thank you to uh, Malaba King and Christoph for coming and giving our first comments. And then of course, for everybody that's joining. So as I mentioned at the onset, our, our next and, and final um, workshop in this series is going to be with Christoph Geiger and, and Alain Rocha, both of whom are here today and talking about what you do without statutes and how courts have used fundamental rights reasoning to open more limited exceptions where they're needed um, through fundamental rights analysis. And I think it's particularly interesting and would actually urge both of you to think about this current COVID moment. There's so many laws around the world that restrict uses to face-to-face, -to, -face, to in the classroom, to on the premise, to all these terms. Even I've seen a couple say on paper, that, that really have no meaningful application in the digital environment. So is fundamental rights reasoning one, one of the ways that we can make copyright relevant to the moment and to the needs that we have? 